LA. The city of angels is also the gang capital of the world. That's how gang bang goes. We kill one of them, they come kill one of us. Okay, everybody back up, back up. Did you see who did it? Did you see who did it? Back up, back up, back up. Back up. Back up. Back up. Back up. Back up. You see everybody's hands. Urban warlords, once organized to protect their neighborhoods, now fight for territory and power. The more streets that you control, the bigger your gang is. And they'll destroy anyone who gets in their way. After I die, the homie's still gonna be talking about the that I've done, and I'm a hood legend. Hundreds of gangs draw battle lines from one neighborhood to the next. They're getting younger and younger. They're getting more violent. We are the most culturally diverse city we're also the most segregated. In a racially charged war, everyone becomes a target. Blacks, they got that animosity, you know, like, uh, our race is better than yours. You saw that you wouldn't even see in a horror movie. And no one sees an end in sight. If they could stop gangbanging, don't you think they would have stopped it already? Los Angeles, California. The name conjures up images of a sun-drenched paradise populated by the rich and famous. But beyond the beachfront mansions, designer boutiques, and Hollywood parties is a violent underworld. Its inhabitants live and die in a vast war zone that stretches across LA County, home to more than 900 street gangs. Bloods and Crips rule throughout Compton and South Central. Florencia 13 claims Firestone. The Avenues have owned the Northeast neighborhoods for years. 204th Street Gang runs Harbor Gateway. They all control different neighborhoods and fight for domination. We do have some 40,000 gang members in the city alone. Uh, double that uh, in Los Angeles County. Uh, a number uh, that is alarming and frightening. This is one of the most bloodiest places in the world. You know, uh, it's hard to compete with places like Afghanistan. But we like to think that it's a pretty dangerous place to live, L.A. This man, who goes by the name Bloodhound, says he's been a member of the L.A. Bloods since he was six years old. The more violent you are, the more people you beat up, the more people you shoot, you stab. It's like a badge of honor. The Bloods and their arch rivals, the Crips, rank among the most powerful and notorious gangs in L.A. Now 32, Bloodhound has survived numerous gun battles with rival gangs and has the scars to prove it. That's the scar from where they cut me open. This uh, is where I got shot nine times, stab wound. I've been shot 23 times on different occasions. I've been shot in the head, point blank, nine times in the chest and stomach. I got shot in the balls. Bloodhound comes from mid-city Los Angeles, where black and Hispanic gangs wield authority over their individual neighborhoods. Whether the police want to admit it or not of the mayor, they don't control certain streets. The gang in that area controls certain streets. Whatever gang wrote that up right there, when they, when they put an arrow down, and that means that this area you're standing on belongs to us. Sergeant Fred Reynolds and Detective Eric Arias are gang investigators for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I mean, that's what it's all about, to be feared. As long as you're feared, and as long as you can intimidate the community and other gang members, then you can con more or less con conduct your business however you see fit, because no one's going to interfere with the way you do things. For every gang, territory, and the drug dealing potential that goes with it are power. Turf boundaries shift as one gang cuts into a rival gang's neighborhood. And to a gangbanger in L.A., your neighborhood is everything. If I grew up in a blood neighborhood, I would have been a blood. If I grew up in a crib neighborhood, I'm going to be a crib. That's just how it is. Those neighborhood boundaries can mean the difference between life and death. If you're in the rival gang territory and you say or do the wrong thing, that could be not just your life. If you have your girlfriend, your mom, your sister, your child with you, that could be the end of their life. You got to be aware of where you at at all times and who around you. That's exactly what gangbanging is. 
a real game banger admit to you, yes, very paranoid lifestyle. The gang capital of the world is also America's most diverse city. Gangs of all races and color, black, Hispanic, Asian, white, battle with and amongst each other to defend and expand their territories. Fight in with rival Crip members and Hispanics and whoever wanted problems. You know, you got to be that stand-up guy while you're in the game. It ain't no turning down no fights. It ain't turning down no turning down nothing. Dying is part of it. That's the way it has to be. And that's the mentality that even the youngest gang member has. You go out there half-ass gang banging, you're not gonna survive. These turf wars between rival gangs have been fought on LA streets for decades. From fighting and went to shooting, and from shooting, we kill one of theirs or kill one of ours, and back and forth, you know? And it won't stop, you know? But a new dimension has been added. Where gang affiliation once determined your fate, race is now playing a leading role in gang-related killings. As LA's Hispanic gang population grew, they went to war with black gangs for domination of the neighborhoods. That battle has now escalated to a race war. Innocent people are being targeted for having the wrong color skin. The Hispanics had a green light on the blacks that they weren't allowed out, allowed out after dark. If they would, they would shoot you. Didn't matter if you're a gang member, um, mom and pop, grandma, didn't matter. As battle lines are drawn street by street, entire communities have been taken hostage. The South LA neighborhood of Harbor Gateway has been a predominantly Hispanic community since the 1970s. Today, Hispanics mainly live in the area north of 206th Street. This is the dividing line. This is the, the line and the street that African Americans could not cross over without fear of murder, fear of racial violence to themselves and their families and loved ones. Caught in the middle of gang warfare brought on by Crips and Bloods, many African-American families escaped West LA and Compton for other neighborhoods. The black population of Harbor Gateway more than doubled in the 1990s. I moved over here thinking that this would be a better location to raise my children. Hispanic gang members who'd claimed the territory north of 206th Street saw the influx of African-Americans as a threat. The 204th Street Gang, named after the street where most of its members live, began attacking blacks to assert their dominance. At first, they targeted gangbangers who tried to move in on the local drug trade. Then they went after innocent civilians. The Latino gang members made it clear that if any African Americans came over on that side, they could face death. December 15th, 2006 a pair of Latino gang members cruised the streets of Harbor Gateway. They were on a mission to kill the first black person they saw. Defying the rules created and enforced by their own gang, they crossed into the African-American area of their neighborhood. Here on Harbor Boulevard, which intersects with 206th Street, they found what they were looking for. A group of black teenagers, including 14-year-old Cheryl Green. She was standing on her scooter and talking with her friends when the Latino gang members approached. One of them drew a weapon. He pointed the gun towards Cheryl and the rest of the people in, her, in, in that direction and just started firing. A bullet ripped through Cheryl's side. The gunman shot three others and then fled. As Cheryl lay here dying, her friends picked her up and tried to rush her to the hospital, but ultimately, she died on the way to the hospital. This is where my daughter was murdered. As you can see, she was trapped. Even if she wanted to run. Cheryl Green and her friends had no gang affiliations, and they were following the unwritten law of the streets, staying on the black side of Harbor Gateway. Cheryl, when she was killed, was in the safe ground, but the Latino gang members crossed over here 
And the next day, when we came back out here, we saw the words NK written in the sidewalk. NK stands for killer. So we're dealing with a violent and racist gang that has no mercy for even little children. It was the seventh racially motivated murder in Harbor Gateway in the last decade. It's a frightening trend, and it threatens to spark a much larger war across America's most diverse city. Now the Bloods and Crips are coming together, and it's mostly unified around race. We're black, and we're both being attacked by Hispanics. I would have done something to another black guy that I seen, you know, just because he was black, you know, and he was an enemy, of course, you know. If you're black, you're an enemy. That's how it is right now. It's a racial war going on. April 29th, 1992. Here in South Central Los Angeles, one of the worst race riots in U.S. history erupted. They lied about the number of blows Mr. King received. They lied about the fact that he was on the ground, not standing, when these blows occurred. Not guilty of the crime of officer. The spark was the acquittal of four white police officers in the beating of black motorist Rodney King. They said today it's still all right to beat the hell out of a black man and walk away. The city was unseen. People were looting, breaking out windows, burning cars. We had our hands full. According to law enforcement, gang members were heavily involved in much of the mayhem. Gang crimes investigator Sergeant Fred Reynolds was on the front lines. The gang members more or less started uh, the rioting. As the riot went on, more and more people got into it. I saw family members, entire families, mother, father, kids running out of stores. LA's gangs participated in a five-day spree of looting, arson, and murder, leaving 55 dead and more than 2,000 injured. Property damages totaled $1 billion. The 1992 riots weren't the first time racial conflicts impacted the city. Race-based violence has been a part of Los Angeles for nearly a century. The early 1900s brought a wave of Mexican immigrants to Los Angeles. Escaping the violence of the Mexican Revolution, they took refuge in the barrios on the outskirts of the city. The immigrants faced harassment from other racial groups who felt they were taking away agricultural jobs. How do you fight mostly whites, but also blacks and others who are after you after organize yourself? Latino men formed neighborhood gangs to ward off attacks. It was the birth of the so-called Cholo. You had to be meaner and tougher than the next guy. And so by the time the 50s rolled around, they transformed themselves into this Cholo gangster culture that now you can say was more gang related. As Latino gangs formed in L.A. during the 1950s, African Americans organized for similar reasons. Black gangs or clubs protected their communities from whites who threatened them with violence. They were often named after their streets and neighborhoods. You know, you had some early gangs like the Slawsons and the Roman Pearls and the, the, uh, the Bishops, and you had the Gladiators. And, and, you know, some of those names even sound kind of uh, movie time kind of things, you know. But these were the groups that, that were very functional back in, in, in that time. The 1960s brought white flight. As white families abandoned the inner city, more blacks moved into the low-income housing of South L.A. As the ranks of black gangs grew, their rivalries intensified, and they switched from bare knuckles brawling to using crude homemade weapons against each other. One of these weapons was the so-called church key. You put that in your pocket, and it was a very hard steal, 
and you could stab somebody with it. You know, you could rake across their face, or you could, you know, uh, you could injure them pretty good. Another favorite was the zip gun, a single shot firearm built with various items such as a rubber band, a nail, and a bullet. If you had a zip gun, you was a bad dude because it just weapons weren't easy to get. So it was poorly made, but that's what kids did back then. In the late 1960s, many gang members left the street life to join the black nationalist movement. Groups like the Black Panthers promoted black power and self-defense and launched social programs to help the urban poor. They were helping kids and, and kind of like um, a militant way of responding to what was happening in the communities, trying to get some structure and some discipline. But these groups collapsed due to aggressive law enforcement tactics. Streets regularly policed by the Black Panthers were left open, paving the way for a new generation of black gangs. The first and most prominent of these gangs was the Crips, who rose to power in the early 1970s. They wore baseball hats, which they would tip, tilt the brim to the left side, and they would always wear their rags in their left pocket. They used to walk with canes, okay, that was part of the way they identified themselves. So uh, one lady uh, actually reported a crime to the police, and she said it was, uh, you know, one of those cripple guys. And that's possibly how the name Crip stuck. By the early 1970s, the perfect recruits for both black and Latino gangs were returning from Vietnam. They brought newfound knowledge of drugs and weapons to their old neighborhoods, making them standouts in local gangs. At the time, Luis Rodriguez was a member of the East LA gang Lomas Locos. He says that the Vietnam veterans who joined his gang made a huge impact. They knew how to rob the armories, so we had a whole mess of weapons we never had before. By the early 70s, we had an array of guns that included hand grenades, machine guns, rifles, shotguns, and all kinds of handguns. Around the same time, the Crips were using intimidation to build their ranks, outnumbering non-Crip gangs by three to one. In response, the non-Crip gangs formed an alliance and called themselves the Bloods. Back in the day, that was not derogatory for blacks to say, how you doing, blood? How you doing, babe? That's like, hey, cousin. The fierce rivalry between Crips and Bloods in South Central LA would span generations and claim thousands of lives. Throughout the 1970s, home territory had always been priority to Latino and black gangs. Protect your neighborhood and don't let no one else come destroy your neighborhood. But as gang membership increased throughout the 1970s, guns and the gangs who carried them became a valuable asset for drug dealers. They would employ the gang members for protection, for bodyguards and stuff like that. Drugs would change many black and Latino communities. By the 1980s, gangs saw a lucrative opportunity with the explosion of cocaine use. They just cut out the drug dealers and figured, why not become drug dealers ourselves? So the gang members started selling the drugs. The gang members stopped chasing out the dope dealers and started becoming dope dealers. Any sense of neighborhood pride fell victim to the dollar. Before then, you had the gang members who more or less were gangsters to protect their neighborhood or to commit acts of violence for their neighborhood. And now the money is involved, the drugs, the money, and the power. So we start slowly forgetting about the morality of the gang. Well, the gang members started uh, preying on the weak. They started becoming the destroyers of the neighborhood. Gangs exploited even greater money-making opportunities with the rise of crack cocaine. Kids who grew up in poverty were moving thousands of dollars worth of drugs a day. Quick money, faster money, more money you ever had in your life. By the mid-1990s, the number of gangbangers living in L.A. reached an all-time high of 150,000. And the drug traffic raised the stakes of their turf wars. Battle lines between Bloods and Crips and Latino gangs meant more than just territory, but also cold, hard cash. It became um, who had the most guns, who had the most money, uh, who was rolling the hardest, who had the largest crew. You have to be from that gang in order to participate in that type of uh, financial enterprise. You have to, because you're, you're, you're taking money out of their pocket. If you ain't from my neighborhood, you ain't making money off my neighborhood, you know? 
If you didn't grow up right there, you're not gonna slang to us. Throughout the evolution of gang culture in Los Angeles, most gangs identified with their race. Yet it wasn't taboo to recruit outside your ethnicity. Occasionally, you get a black guy who would join a Hispanic gang. And he would be, his nickname would be Negro or Crow. You might get a Hispanic guy that would be in a black gang, you know. They would call him Cherokee or Chino or something like that. This would soon change. As competition for turf escalated, Latino gangs began banding together under one racially unified umbrella. They called this new super gang, Sureños. LA is rapidly becoming a Latino city. In 2005, Hispanics made up over 46% of the population, as opposed to African Americans, who made up less than 10%. Only a small percentage of these groups are involved in gang activity, but the overall numbers are staggering. There are approximately 25,000 black gangbangers compared to around 53,000 Hispanic gang members in Los Angeles. And Latinos are fighting to take over black turf. For the most part, as far as racial tensions, the law-abiding citizens, I don't think there's a problem with blacks and Hispanics getting along. Um, there is a problem with black gangs and Hispanic gangs, definitely. And that, that has added some fuel to the fire. Part of the problem is that the Sereno super gang identifies themselves by their race. With African American and Latinos occupying the same neighborhoods, racial hostilities have flared up. Those tensions soon spilled over into the communities. Gangbangers and innocents alike became casualties in this new era of racial warfare. You shoot at your enemies, you try to do every little things, you know, just like who race is the strongest, you know. the Firestone section of South L.A. Yeah, we're normally partners. He hasn't got rid of me yet. <laughs> L.A. County Sheriff's Department detectives Sean Shaw and Terry Bergen cruise this neighborhood looking for suspicious activity. The Sheriff's Department is on the front lines of the gang war in Los Angeles. They hear a whistle as they turn a street corner. And it's basically they're signaling that there's uh, law enforcement in the neighborhood. So if there's any, anybody doing anything illegal, we'll let them know that there's, you know, sheriff's, sheriff or LAPD, whichever, whoever was over here, is uh, in the area. Firestone is home to both black gangs like the East Coast Crips and Hispanic gangs like Florencia 13. The good citizens that live in the neighborhood are affected by the 5% of citizens that, that are out there to commit crime and, and cause havoc and, and scare all of the good citizens in the neighborhood. Since the early 1990s, police have seen violence on the streets increase between black and Latino gangs. It now makes up about 75% of Shaw and Bergen's caseload. The biggest probably ongoing trend is probably black versus brown. It's pretty much it right now. For our, on our side, you know, I can't speak for uh, LAPD or you know, the, our surrounding uh, agencies that support us, but for, for ours, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty predominant. Based on my opinion, I would say yeah. A lot of the uh, violence would be hate-based. There's a gang-related shooting here almost every day. Tonight is no different. 1252 31st Street, uh, start rolling that way, two down. Right there. Sean Bergen cross into turf belonging to a powerful Sereno gang, Florencia 13. A rival gang has crossed into their neighborhood and fired on a group of innocent bystanders. As they reach the crime scene, the shooters have already fled. Did you see who did it? Did you see who did it? No, we saw the car when it passed by. Did you see who did? Oh, yeah, Where? They find two young Hispanic males wounded and bleeding. Is there two people shot or one? Hey, did you see anything? They shot me. Were, were they in a car? Okay, hey, help us out. All right, help us catch the guy that shot you. All right, where do you think you got shot? Down below? Yeah. All right, hang, hang tight. If you didn't see anything, move back. Here they come. Hang on, man. 
Shaw and Bergen learn that neither of the shooting victims is a gang member. These two teenagers became target practice for enemies of Florencia. Mistaken for members of Florencia 13, they became innocent victims in the wrong place at the wrong time. Preliminary reports indicate that the suspects parked in this liquor store parking lot right here, got out on foot and shot into a group of uh, male Hispanics that were standing out there. Florencia 13 is one of the hundreds of gangs that fall under the banner of the Sereños or Southerners. All Sereños pay their allegiance to a higher gang authority, the prison gang known as the Mexican Mafia. The Mexican Mafia obviously mirrors itself after uh, the Italian mob. They have a, a hierarchy. The Mexican Mafia, you know, runs Hispanic gangs for the most part from within the prison. The Mexican Mafia, or La M A, was originally a prison gang formed to protect Hispanic inmates from whites, blacks, and prison guards. But the organization grew rapidly, and it soon became involved in criminal enterprises, extortion, narcotics, and murder, both behind bars and on the streets. Almost every Hispanic gang in Southern California has to pay taxes to the Mexican Mafia, and they get order, certain orders from the Mexican Mafia. In return for their allegiance to the Mexican Mafia, Sereno gang members receive protection when they enter prison. On the streets, they'll war with each other. In here, when the Hispanics come in, they all come together as one. That street beef, it's gone. In here, they all fall under the same umbrella. Droopy, a member of an LA street gang, witnessed firsthand the segregation that happens in prison. I did five and a half years for the same robberies. Basically in the area when you're in prison, it's all about your own race sticking together against other races, against whites, black, others, you know? It's a question of survival. There's strength in numbers. At one time, the, the uh, African-American inmates, they were uh, the dominating factor, and now it's turned around. Now it's the Hispanics. Uh, numbers mean power. A black man says, yeah, I hung out with Hispanics all my life on the streets. But they get in here and it's a no-no. They don't like dealing with Hispanics because for fear of retaliation from their own people. You know, hey, why are you dealing with the Hispanic? And these are the rules that they put upon themselves. Latino inmates will go so far as to attack fellow Hispanics just for associating with blacks. This inmate was getting released. He had all his gear, he was getting ready to leave. And he saw this Hispanic inmate playing dominoes on a, on a table with other black inmates. He went back into his cell, he got a razor blade, he went behind the Hispanic, and he proceeded to cut up his face. Ah! Here's a guy that was just getting released. I later interviewed him and I said, can you tell me why you did this? He goes, I, I'm hoping that this will uh, bring me up a couple notches within the, uh, the Hispanic gangs. The racist attitudes that divide black and Latino gangbangers in prison often become ingrained in them by the time they return to the outside world. A lot of guys are getting out of prison mentality and going to, back to their neighborhood and saying like, hey, you know, these blacks or these Mexicans, you know, that's how it is right now. Race will pump me up more, you know, like, just because they were black, I would want to get them more than a regular enemy, you know? By the late 1990s, race-motivated gang murders in L.A. began grabbing headlines. A disproportionate number of these crimes involved Hispanic gangs killing black gangbangers or even black civilians because of their skin color. Authorities believe that Mexican Mafia leaders have ordered their Sereno foot soldiers to expel blacks from the growing Hispanic neighborhoods. Said that if we saw an African American in our neighborhood, we should shoot him, harass him, kill him. Why are the Hispanics attacking us? Because we're, we're black. They want to control the the drug flow inside the neighborhood. It's probably connected. And I, I won't I won't say if it, it's not. They outnumber us ten to one. They outnumber the Bloods and Crips, and they're they're making a, a play for power. Los Angeles, the quest for money and power is king. The rich and famous claim their turf in Hollywood and Beverly Hills, 
while the gangbangers rule South LA. For many from these mean streets, gang life is a form of celebrity. But this fame can come at a heavy price. You join a gang, there's two, two things that's gonna happen. You're either gonna end up in prison for a long time, or you're gonna end up dead. They're all fighting. At, at any given time, all the gangs in Compton are fighting. The battle lines are drawn, literally, on public walls throughout LA. Black and Hispanic gangs use graffiti to tag their names to buildings. It's kind of like a warning, letting the Crips know his blood's over here. So if you choose to come in here, you better be careful how you conduct yourself. Gangs cross out their rivals' names and replace them with their own tags as a call to battle. It's a signal they are making a play for turf. Crossing, tagging out, you know, the enemy's tagging. Go cross them out, put your hood on there, you know? Just another way of saying your hood, you know? They cross you out in, in the walls, you know? That means they want you know? So you go back and tell them what's up and cross them back out or shoot at them, you know? There are people that, you know, they don't value life. They're willing to kill somebody for crossing them out on the wall. Police say that Hispanic gangs use graffiti much more often than black gangs. The tag of the Mexican mafia is showing up everywhere. When you ever see initials and the 13s on the end of it, that means that they submit to the world of the Mexican mafia. Another name for the Mexican mafia is La M, the letter M in Spanish. M is the 13th letter in the alphabet. Using 13 in a tag is Sereno code for showing allegiance to the Mexican Mafia. One of the most ruthless Hispanic gangs that pledges allegiance to the Mexican Mafia is called the Avenues. Here in Highland Park, a Northeast LA neighborhood, the Avenues gang has waged a campaign of terror against innocent black residents since 1994. With an army of 800 soldiers, the Avenues aim to rid the multi-ethnic community of its black population. Avenue gang members thought it was inappropriate that an African-American could just walk around their neighborhood. They would uh, pistol whip African-Americans and they would shoot at them. These attacks turned deadly on the night of April 18, 1999. As 38-year-old Kenneth Wilson parked his car outside a friend's home, a van full of Avenue's members rolled by. One of the Avenue gang members saw Mr. Wilson, uh, turned to the other members in the van and said, hey, there's a you guys want to kill. The Avenues opened fire on Wilson, blasting him with rounds from a 12-gauge shotgun and a semi-automatic handgun. One of the gang members ran back into the vans and he had always wanted to test out the gun and that was a good way to do it. In October 2000, Highland Park resident Christopher Bowser, a father of four with no gang affiliation, filed a complaint against an Avenues member for jumping him. It was not Bowser's first run-in with the Avenues. He'd been regularly chased by gangbangers and shot at. They flashed guns at him. They said, get out of the neighborhood, go down to South Central where you belong, uh, leave this territory. A month later, the Avenues paid Christopher Bowser back for filing the police report. While standing at a bus stop in Highland Park in broad daylight, he was shot in the head. He was assassinated for the color of his skin uh, as well as, quite frankly, standing up to the Avenue's gang members. Around that same time, 21-year-old student Anthony Prudhomme moved into an apartment in Highland Park. His mother, Louisa, wasn't aware of the gang problem there. He was happy, happy than I'd ever seen him when he was independent. He got to do what he wanted to do. No more mom nagging him or anything, you know? On November 3rd, 2000, Avenue's gunman kicked down his door in the middle of the night. Prude Holmes' neighbor heard it all unfold. He heard Anthony shouting, I swear to God, I don't have any money. I swear to God. He said he didn't hear a gunshot or anything. He just heard a couple of thumps, like thump, thump. One of the gunmen shoved a pillow over Prude Holmes' head and fired into it twice. We had no idea about how vicious the gangs were down there. They'll shoot people in their bed, unarmed. And that's that whole culture. That whole culture is is to kill and to, to, to hurt, destroy, because it, what, it's insane, that's what it is. Police eventually arrested Avenue's gang member Porfirio Avila and charged him with the murders of Wilson, Prudholm, and Bowser. They also arrested three other Avenue's members in connection with the murders. 
In August 2006, a jury convicted all four gangbangers of violating a federal hate crime statute in a landmark verdict. The men were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The racially motivated murders in Highland Park reflected the growing trend in many black and Hispanic neighborhoods throughout LA. As Hispanic gangs expand their territory and power, they're targeting innocent blacks to drive them out. I'm not gonna condemn them for it because when you're involved in uh, criminal activity, there's really no rules. There's no rule book on how to be a gangster and how to be a criminal. What gang members should and shouldn't do toward their enemies or toward rival gangs or people who just aren't from their gang or from their race. Have you heard of a book like that? All the Serrano gangs appear to be following the same strategy. Anything, anything that makes money, they're gonna do it. The Hispanics have pushed the black dudes off the street corners in Los Angeles, and they've taken over. Only one authority could direct so many of the Serrano's in such a coordinated effort. The gangs that have been involved in racial attacks are getting orders from the Mexican Mafia. Racial hostilities have driven a sharp wedge between black and Hispanic gangs in recent years. There is now deep distrust on both sides. Most black gangs have decided not to recruit any uh, Hispanic members anymore. Before, Hispanics, if you wanted to join a black gang like the Bloods or predominantly black gang like the Crips, you could join, not a problem. Now, as one of my friends said, we're not taking applications from Latinos. A lot of kids are having to deal with that race problem. You know, a lot of people grow with blacks, you know. I grew up with blacks, you know, but just that's how it is, you know. It's just a power struggle out there in the streets. To combat that power struggle, the city of L.A. has adopted controversial new tactics that some argue hold. January 18th, 2007, the Harbor Gateway neighborhood. It's been a month since 14-year-old Cheryl Green died at the hands of the 204th Street Gang. Hi, how you be? Looking pretty good. She all big and stuff. An innocent African-American murdered by Hispanic gang members. Her death caused an uproar throughout LA's communities. No one should have to fear for their life because of the color of their skin. LA's mayor, Antonio Viragosa, held a press conference vowing to put an end to the violence. So we have a message for the gang leaders. We're coming with everything we have and we're putting you out of business. In response to statistics of rising gang violence and the murder of innocent victims, Mayor Viragosa released a new plan. The city created the first ever list of the 10 most wanted gang members. The hope was that the public would help police identify and arrest gangbangers. On its release, the list and the mayor drew criticism. Many people said all we're doing is glorifying those individual gang members and the gangs. And I can tell you that we've already caught four of the top 10 gang members on that list. Gang members say that for every top 10 banger who's caught, more will commit crimes to make it onto the list. To them, it's a badge of honor. A lot of people are not scared to be on the top 10. You know, if anything, they want to be on the top 10. I'd like to see my hood up there with everybody else. <laughs> you know, it's like a plaque on the wall. I don't know what the JM is standing for here. Um, Southside JM. How you doing? Okay. You living right here? What what does um what does the JM mean? Why? It's, it's not nothing to go to court or nothing. Yeah, you can tell us what the J is the name of the gang. Well, all we want to know is the name of the gang. That's all. The only gang is the Junior Mafia. Junior Mafia. There you go. Thank you very much, darling. All right. It's like pulling teeth. Law enforcement working the streets say that more than any top 10 list, the real solution to LA's gang problem lies in the communities. In the neighborhoods where these people live at, they know who's committing the crime. They know who the top 10 are. So what good would it do for me to print out a list of, these are the guys in the neighborhood committing the crimes. They know, they just won't tell us. According to many former gang members, the cops are right. Neighborhood loyalty is at the heart of the problem. Bangers, both black and Hispanic, say the violence stops when gang members reach the point where defending their neighborhood is no longer a priority. 
these gang members have started to make that connection. If I got to think about my son, I'm one of the people that wants to be there for my child. I put my son before the hood, before my homies. I was willing to give my life for my neighborhood, you know, and I almost did. I'm tired of that lifestyle, you know. I've been stabbed, I've been shot, and it's not fun no more, you know. Being out in the corner is not fun, man. Not, not just because you're black, you're going to be harm to me. I'm not worried about that. These people don't mean no harm to me, you know. Now I understand that, you know. But it often takes the death of close friends to end the violence. Like one time, this black gang 20 try to like take try to take over the R Street because we're selling a lot of drugs. So we had them for a while, for like almost two years, and then they stopped because a lot of my homeboys and their homeboys grew up, you know. So a lot of people they knew each other were dying, you know. I got the teardrop when my homeboy Wino died. What's that name, blood? What's that name, blood? What's that name, blood? Bloodhound says Wino was killed after he flashed gang signs at rival bangers. Shots was fired. He stumbled. He died right here. He died right here before he could make it home. Along with his teardrop tattoo, Bloodhound has another way to remember his friend by tipping a bottle of alcohol. This is something gangbangers of every race find themselves doing all too often. Pour some out for my homie. That's a custom where I come from. Bloods, Crips, a lot of Cholos do the same thing. You pour some out, your homie has a drink with you. It's a memory of him. It's like me, I'm gonna renew my vow to, uh, to try to push for peace, you know, between Bloods and Crips, and eventually, you know, between Blacks and Latinos. For Bloodhound, walking away means literally erasing his past. A painful process, tattoo removals can cost thousands of dollars. Clean Slate, run by former gang members, offers the service for free. The energy breaks down, the paint tattoo starts to disappear. What's the purpose of me having a Crip killer on my arm if I don't believe in killing Crips anymore? I'm not going around shooting at the police, and thank God they're not, you know, shooting at me. <laughs> so, uh, kind of defeats the purpose of having that tattoo. Damn, that hurts. Oh, L.A. may never shake its status as gang capital of the world. Beyond the Hollywood Hills, alliances continue to form as tensions build between Hispanic and black gangs. Strong in numbers, Latino gangs are using race to expand territory. The bigger you are, the you know, you want to get bigger and bigger, you know. Whoever's in your way, you got to take care of them, you know, so you could just expand, you know, your gang. You go at it with your own race, but, you know, mostly right now, you know, you just go at it mostly with blacks because they're right there around your neighborhood. You try to take care of them more. In L.A.'s ongoing gang battle for territory and power, not even their enemies can blame them. They outnumber us. 10 to 1 or more. But it's what's happening, because if Bloods and Crips outnumbered uh, Chicanos, who's to say we wouldn't be doing the same thing? I don't know. Race on race violence is only the latest chapter in a history of gang warfare spanning decades. How do you straighten out a racial problem? How do you straighten out some reason for a person not to like another person? It's a formidable task, but I think that that's going to be or could possibly be one of the real battlefields for communities and law enforcement. For all the gangsters who leave the game, there's a new generation ready to die for his neighborhood with no end in sight. You have a younger crew that lives in the neighborhood, and then they want to carry on the uh, tradition of the neighborhood. You're not going to get rid of the gangs. It's not going to happen. If they could have done it, they would have did it 20 years ago. You know, it's easier to get weeds out of your yard than it is to get gangs out of your community.